in worship. Now take your copy of God's Word, whether in print form or electronic, take it out, turn it on, and go to Isaiah, the 30th chapter. That's where we'll start today in just a few moments as we talk about this idea of rest. Just think about that word. It's one of the words that as we say it, we kind of express some of its emotive nature. Like, I feel like I need to take a deep breath and say, rest. Maybe you can do that with me. Just take a deep breath. Now, rest. That's what God wants of us. And yet, as you're going to see in these next few minutes, too often, it seems that that's not what we want from Him. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. I want you to think about your habits as a driver or automobile owner. When do you fill up your tank? No, really. I mean, that's, we're different that way. Do you do it when it's a fourth of a tank, when it's half of a tank, or, or when the light comes on? I mean, let's be real. <laughs> Studies have shown that when you do this says a lot about your personality and actually even your age. The majority of those 18 to 34 fill up when it's less than a fourth of a tank. Those that are 35 to 54 usually fill up between a fourth and a half. Those that are 55 and over more often than not fill up once it's at a half a tank. But 32% of the people, and I want to see if you're in this club, 32% of vehicle owners don't fill up the tank until the light comes on. Let me see your hands. Wow. Wow, we're playing a dangerous game. <laughs> and I know this because here we were, a young couple, moving from our graduate studies at Southwestern Seminary and being on staff at the great Prestonwood Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas, to our new call in Montgomery, Alabama. We loaded up all of our worldly possessions in a U-Haul. We put one of our cars on a trailer behind the U-Haul. Kimberly drove the other car, I drove the U-Haul, and we were making good time, traveling out of Texas on I-20 and almost made it to the state of Louisiana <laughs> when that U-Haul just stopped. I thought, what in the world? They gave me a bad automobile. Why did this truck stop? And then I looked right in front of me. There was this monitor, this little lever that seemed to go back and forth between full and empty. And it was on empty. I thought, this is not a good sign. <laughs> this is how my adult life is starting. I'm starting out on empty. And a lot of us do that in our vehicles, and it's not a good thing to do because you can run out of gas. Hello. But it's also not good for the vehicle, right? Because you get down so low that the junk in that tank begins to rustle around and get all up in the other parts of the car. It can cause all kinds of problems. And yet, I'm still, <laughs> still guilty of that in my car. And I'm afraid I may be guilty of that in my life. And I think some of you may be. You, you wait till you are physically and emotionally and spiritually on empty until you try to do something about it and often it's, it's too late. Beyond that, some of us have a different problem. Our, our tank is draining and we're trying to fill that tank with something that's never going to meet our needs. It's never going to satisfy us. And so as we open God's Word in these next few minutes, I, I, I want you to see that if we fail to fill our tanks in the way that God plans for us to do so, the way He's commanded us, in fact, it's always going to cost us more and cause more harm. But before I jump into that passage in Isaiah, I, I want to take you back to what really is the foundational verse for this whole series. And it comes from Matthew 11, verse 28, where Jesus Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary 
and burdened, and I will give you rest. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Just think about it. Could, it. could it be that simple? Could it be that the creator of all that is made us in such a way that those greatest needs, those deepest longings, those wants that we have can be met, but they're only met as we come to him? Could it, could it be that a lot of us have gotten this wrong? That we've made this about what we do. And we're not bad at it. We may even be good at it. We check off our list of do's. But we go home and we look in the mirror and, and, and who we are is not good. We're not at rest. We're not living in peace well, Scripture teaches that God is saying to us, just come to me with all your needs. Come to me with your deepest longings. Come to me with that which makes you weary, and I will give you rest. You see, this whole idea is built on the reality that God wants us to find our rest, our, our satisfaction, and our contentment in Him, and nothing else will give us what we're looking for. That's why the church father, Augustine, said so many years ago, you, God, have made us for yourself, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. I want to pray once more before we read this passage of Scripture, but as we pray, I, I want us to do so with a song in our mind, a, a song that I, I remember hearing my mom sing as she would work around the house as I was growing up as a child. The lyrics of the song say this, fill my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting in my soul, bread of heaven, Feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup. Fill it up. And make me whole. I wonder if you would take your palms and turn them up and maybe make them a little cup that you would hold before the Lord. And let's pray. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we, we come again declaring who you are and all that that means for this moment. We can say we will rest in the Father's hands and we'll put all the rest in the Father's hands. So Lord, in this moment, we pray that you would speak, giving us what we need that we don't yet have, teaching us what we need to learn but we don't know, and making us different. Oh God, would you redeem this time? In fact, Lord, would you sanctify this time? Lord, use even me, the words I say and even my thoughts be pleasing to you. And God, what we're doing is investing in eternity, so I pray that maybe, Lord, there would be someone here today, someone who hears these words that begins a relationship with you, and their eternity is changed because we've heard from you today. So here we are, Lord, with open hands. Fill our cup, Lord. Fill it up, Lord. And do this in the name of Jesus. Amen. I want you to understand the context of Isaiah chapter 30. But before we get to that, I want to remind you why we're talking about this subject. We started last week in the book of Genesis, and we started literally on the first page of the Bible because it says, In the beginning, God what? God created the heavens and the earth. And, and we, we discover as we're introduced to God in, in, in this ancient Hebrew text that our God is a God of work. And, and that's important because 
any understanding of God should tell us we want to be like Him in, in every way that we can. So work should bring glory to God. What we do should bring pleasure to God because He's a God of work. And so God worked and He created the sky. And God worked and He created the, the land. And God worked and He created the sea. And God worked and He created birds for the sky and fish for the sea and animals for the land. And God worked and He created man. And then God did His greatest work of all and He created woman. In fact, we, we, we said you could look at it this way. God worked and worked and worked and worked and worked and worked. And then he rested. he rested. And so Genesis chapter 2 begins with this idea of God, who the Bible tells us never grows weary, resting. He rested. And, and then it says he blessed that seventh day. And, and that's so significant. Maybe something you've never thought of, that God blessed a day. He blessed time. He sanctified time. And in doing so, he gives us this pattern, this rhythm where he expects us to sanctify time. And we're to make our days holy. And then it says he looked around and he delighted and said, oh, this is good. And yet I, I look at those of us created in his image and, and bearing that Imago day. many of us who have the relationship with Jesus Christ, and, and yet that's not how we describe our lives, a lives of rest, a lives where we delight and worship him, a life where we look at what is and say, yes, this is good. No, from too many of us, we're pulled in different directions and we're filled with anxiety and life is stressful and it's anything but good. We long for Eden. We long for the garden where sin had not entered the world and things had not gotten so difficult. And, and yet I would suggest to you today it's not just the place of Eden that we long for or not even the grace of Eden where you had that deep, close relationship with a God who walked with you and talked with you in the garden, but we long for that pace of Eden where that rhythm of time was set forth by our Creator. The Sabbath, a rest. We've learned that word in the Hebrew, you pronounce it Shabbat. In fact, you also, also often think of it as Shabbat Shalom, a, a Sabbath peace or a, a deep rest. That word simply means to stop, to cease. So what are you stopping? You're, you're stopping working. And, and so in that ancient Jewish tradition, there would be no work, but that wasn't the end of it. You, you didn't just do nothing. It wasn't stopping working alone. It was stopping worrying. You didn't worry. It was stopping wanting. You didn't want for more. You put everything out of your mind so that you could rest. And that rest may be sleeping We've learned through medical science the benefits of sleep. We see the damage that takes place when you don't get a good night's sleep. It may be quietness. It's unusual, isn't it? Not a big part of our existence. But it's also delighting. It's, it's finding that which brings you joy. And, and I think as I've, I've jumped into this study, that's one of the things that is, has just caused concern in my life because I, I begin to say, what brings me that kind of joy for, for most of my adult life? I've, I've said, this brings me joy. The Lord's church and ministry brings me joy. And, and, and now for many years, I've said, my family brings me joy. But I'm recognizing that there should be things in my life that that I so enjoy doing that it just makes me think of the goodness of God, which then leads me to worship Him more. Worship is what we do in this place in part, to reset us, to refocus us, to recenter us, so that as we go into another week, we're prepared. And yet we're, we're confused because... We go from seeing this creation of the Sabbath by God to the command of the Sabbath by God in Exodus 20. 
that we have the Ten Commandments, and one of the Ten Commandments, the fourth commandment, the longest commandment, the only commandment with a, a description of why we need to do this is to remember the Sabbath. And so is this a rule, or is this a rhythm of life? So last week we, we learned that Sabbath rest is really a blessing created by God to be enjoyed through a relationship with Christ. It's not a burden just to be endured out of religious duty. So Sabbath is not less than what we're enjoying here, but it's so much more than this. It's not just a couple of hours in a day. It's this rhythm of life that God's given us. And yet, all throughout the Bible, there was this struggle with, what do we do with this thing, this idea, this mentality of Sabbath? Jesus encountered it. I told you that story last week. He was walking through a wheat field with his disciples. One of the disciples picked some wheat, which the religious leaders, the legalists, the Pharisees, they said, you can't do that. That was one of 39 things you could not do on the Sabbath. And so Jesus had to set them straight. He reminded them of the purpose of the Sabbath. And in that, he reminds us, and it, it reacquaints us with this idea of rest because so many of us, when we, we rest, we, we think of it this way, we're, we're resting from our work. And, and so at the end of our work week, we're just counting down the days, and we say, TGIF, thank God it's Friday. Or when vacation's coming, you're counting down the clock until when you go on vacation. Or, or like I mentioned last week, some of you school te teachers are telling on yourself because about that third week in January, you start putting the countdown of how many days of school you've got left. And so you're thinking of rest as, hey, when my work is done, I can rest. And, and, and yet, no, God is saying, I, I want you to develop rest in such a way that you're resting far work. That rest is feeding you, that it's, it's fueling you, and it's empowering everything that you do. And so throughout scriptures, we see warnings to rest, and, and we even see what happens when you fail to rest. We see that God lets us fail. And maybe, maybe you've been there. Maybe you've been burned out, or you're worn out, and all the things that this failure to rest brings has been poured out into your life. You've learned something you're going to see in Isaiah, and that is that God will ruthlessly expose our need for Him, but He'll always be relentless in expressing His grace for us. I want you to think about that. Could, could God in his justice, in his holiness, could, could he allow that which is weak within us to be exposed so that we might become desperate for the grace that only he can give? And the answer is yes. Yes. That, that's who he is. That's what he does. And, and that's what we find taking place in Isaiah 30 all these years ago. Here's the context. The children of Israel are once again finding themselves in this place where another country, people who don't follow the one true God are coming after them. In this case, it's the Assyrians. And the attack of the Assyrians is imminent. And so they're trying to figure out what to do. And there are four options. One is to wave the white flag, just surrender. That's not a good plan, right? Just, it's not a good plan because then the Assyrians would come in and kill them. They would rape and pillage their wives and children. They would enslave them. It would not be good. Secondly, they could just say, all right, let's do this in the, in the power of our own strength. That wouldn't be good either because in that point in history, the Assyrians were way more powerful than this group of the children of Israel. Or they could maybe form some alliance with what would have been an enemy. We call that an unholy alliance. In other words, they're, they're um, making a compromise with the world in, in order to maybe make it through. Not a good idea. Or they could turn back to God and say, I, we can't do this without you. 
Now, what's interesting as I look at those is, and I think about the things that make us rest less. I think about the things that cause us not to rest. So can we just list some of those? Because they're affecting some of us in this room. You know, when we face physical illness, that causes restlessness. So some of you are battling cancer. Some of you are battling something that causes chronic pain or, or just continuing medical problems. And, and that causes restlessness, all right? That's one thing. Uh, let's think of another big one, relational tension and strife. So a marriage or another relationship that's not going well, and that just causes restlessness. I'm not at peace. I'm, I'm not calm. I'm not at rest, all right? How about a big one? Finances. Financial stress, man, it robs you of rest. You could go on and on. Spiritual dryness, addictions, hurts and habits and other hang-ups, all of these things can rob you of rest. And so you have the same challenge that the children of Israel had. What do I do? Do I just give in? And, and some of you do. That's what we sometimes do. So you give in to those bad habits or, or, or you just give up on a relationship or you don't fight for your health. Well, or do you just do it in your own strength? That's what a lot of us do. We pull ourselves up by the bootstraps and say, bless God, I can do this. Until we figure out that our strength runs out. Or, or do you compromise? Do you make unholy alliances? We give in to the ways of the world. Or do you repent and trust Christ? Isaiah 30, verse 1. Woe to the obstinate children, declares the Lord, to those who carry out plans that are not mine. Oh, and I wonder how often in my life my God has looked at me and said, Woe to you, Paul. Stubborn Paul, you've done it your way again. forming an alliance, not by my spirit. You're heaping sin upon sin. Who go down to Egypt without consulting me. Who look for help to Pharaoh's protection. To Egypt's shade for refuge. But Pharaoh's protection will be your shame. Egypt's shade will bring you disgrace. Though they have officials in Zon and their envoys have arrived in Haines, everyone will be put to shame because of people useless to them who bring neither help nor advantage, only shame and disgrace. So Israel, and then in turn us, we, we find ourselves at a crossroad. Do we do this our way or God's way? We choose our way, and the end result is always the same. Did you see it? Shame and sorrow. All right, this is where a little boy sits down and a man stands up. Sort of little girl sits down and the young lady stands up. I wonder how many of you would be bold enough with the pastor to say, yeah, I recognize that path. I've, I've gone with my plans before instead of God's and I've ended up with shame and sorrow. Anybody else in the room? Yeah. What do you do when you find yourself there? When we don't follow God's road to rest, his strategies for Sabbath, this refuge, and you end up in trouble. Uh, understand what was going on here, because it's, it's, it's really interesting. The children of Israel chose to have an alliance with Egypt. Do you remember the relationship with the children of Israel and Egypt? If you made it through four-year-old or five-year-old Sunday school, you should know this, even those of us from back in the flannel board days, right? What were the children of Israel to the Egyptians back in the day? What do we call them? They were slaves. And yet here they are when they have access to God and God is showing them the way. They say, nah, we think we got this figured out. We'll take care of this, God. We're going back to Egypt. And that's what sin does in our lives. We have this taste of Eden. God shows us his grace. We experience his pace. But then something cramps our rest and disrupts the rhythm. And we all of a sudden think it's better in Egypt. 
That's why we relapse into addictions and habits. That's why we go back into relationships that are harmful and hurtful. That's why we find ourselves being destructive to other people. Really, it's because we want more than what we experience from God in the moment. We think what He's giving us today is not enough. That's another question maybe you should ask. How much is enough for you? We live in a culture of more. Everything screams to you, more! Every advertisement, more! Shoot, you... you even just talk about something with your cell phone in the room and then you open Facebook and, and you see an advertisement that says you need more. You think your car is fine and you're making a good stewardship decision until your neighbor pulls into their driveway with a brand new one and then you think I need more. Think your house is fine until your friend gets a new house and you see all the amenities and how they don't have to worry about what you're worrying about and you want more. You're thinking you can make it on what you earn until you realize, hey, I don't have everything everybody else has and you want more. And where is that getting us in our society? You know what our biggest buildings are? Storage units. Storage units are a $38 billion industry in our country. Before we moved Kimberly's parents to Texas several years ago. She began to go and help clean up their house and deal with their possessions only to find out they had three different storage units. And so do some of you. And what's interesting, you, you drive around some of the most impoverished areas of Tampa or as I've done recently, you do that in Orlando. And everywhere you find storage units. Did you know it said that there are enough storage units in America that every American could have seven square feet of storage to themselves? We could live in our storage units. And why do we have so many storage units? Because we want more. And why do we want more? Because we're not content. And why are we not content? Because we're trying to find and meet our satisfaction and contentment in the wrong places. We're eat up with comparison. When I was growing up, we called that keeping up with the Joneses. In competition, we want more. That's what the deceiver tells us. That's what sin does. It's never enough. And so we're created with this reality that God knows what we need. And then he loves us so much, he tells us, come to me and I'll give you rest. And yet we look everywhere else on the planet but to him. And we wonder why we're not satisfied. We talked about the Sabbath commands. There are two different commands in Scripture. Two different descriptions of the Ten Commandments. The first is in Exodus 20. That happened after Mount Sinai when Moses came down and talked to the children of Israel. The second one is in Deuteronomy chapter 5. The passage in Deuteronomy chapter 5 happens 40 years later. Same Ten Commandments. Why 40 years later? They're about to go into the promised land, and these are the kids of the people that he had told it to after coming down from the mountain. And it's just a reminder. The things of God have to be passed down from generation to generation. Look at me, parent. You can change the generational path for your family with your decisions, good or bad. But so Moses was meeting with this next generation that was about to go into the promised land, and he was going back through the Ten Commandments. When he gets to the fourth commandment, the Sabbath, it sounds a little differently. First of all, instead of saying remember the Sabbath, he's saying observe it. Because now this has been something that's been built in for 40 years. So you know about this, observe the Sabbath by keeping it holy, as the Lord your God's commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male, nor your female servant, nor your ox, or your donkey, or any of the animals, nor any foreigner residing in your town, so that your male and female servants may rest as you do. All of that's the same. But then in Deuteronomy we find something different. Listen to what he says next. Remember... You were slaves in Egypt, 
And the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. What's the difference between Exodus and Deuteronomy in this commandment? It's that verse 15. Part of the Sabbath experience involves taking time to remember what God has delivered you from. What God has brought you out of with his mighty hand and his outstretched arm and how that causes you to worship him. So what God is saying in Deuteronomy is, hey, remember you've got a reason to celebrate who God is. You've got a reason to rest in him. So make this time holy. Dedicate this day to him because he's worth it. You don't need to go back in to slavery. Now let's go back to Isaiah 30. The children of Israel want to go back to Egypt. They're just like the children of Israel were in the wilderness, right? You remember the first time they began to have a hard day? What happened? Oh, we want to go back to Egypt. At least we knew we were getting fed there. Oh, we want to go back to Egypt. At least we knew when we were about to get a beating. I mean, how silly is that? And yet here we are all these years later and they're partnering up with those who had enslaved them. So verse 15, this is what the Holy Sovereign, the, the Sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says, in repentance and rest is your salvation. Did you catch that? In repentance and rest, in quietness. Quietness and trust is your strength. But you would have none of it. You said, no, we'll flee on our horses. Therefore, you'll flee. You said, we'll ride off on swift horses. Therefore, your pursuers will be swift. A thousand will flee at the threat of one and the threat of five. You will all flee away till you are left like a flagstaff on a mountaintop, like a banner on a hero. Yet, yet. The Lord longs to be gracious to you. Therefore, he will rise up to show you compassion. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all who wait for him. You see how good God is? He always offers a way out. You're never going to find yourself in a situation that catches God off guard. And as a, as a result of that, you're, you're never going to find yourself in a situation in which, as the Apostle Paul says, he doesn't provide a way out of. But it may mean that you have to wait on him. It may mean that you have to rest in him. He offers salvation and strength, but it comes through repentance and rest. And so they chose shame and, sh and sorrow. Remember what I said at the beginning of the message. God will ruthlessly expose, expose our need for him, but he'll always be relentless in expressing his grace for us. So he promises his strength. He allows them to experience defeat. And then he says, but I have you know, I'm still here if you'll just wait for me. Hey, real quick, are there any other examples where God let his all-stars do it their way and fail? Oh, yeah. All throughout the scripture. Moses, you could go back further to him. Abraham, you could fast forward to David. But let me tell you about Elijah. Elijah, man, this mighty prophet of God. Just think of some of what he experienced. God fed him in the middle of a famine and drought. God used him to bring someone to life. God used him as his spokesman to stand down false prophets and to experience great victory. And yet in 1 Kings 19, we find him in the valley of depression up under a tree, crying out to God saying, let me die. And then he does what depression and restlessness causes you to do. He climbs into bed and he covers his head. 
And so a messenger of the Lord comes and wakes him up, says, hey, time to eat. He gives him some food. He gives him some water. And he goes back to sleep. You know, I, I read that story in 1 Kings 19, and I'm reminded, and, and, and some of you who are trying to find the answer and other things, tune in here. Sometimes it's not another conference you need. It's not a new seminar. It's not the latest Christian book. Sometimes you just need to rest. So the messenger of God comes and wakes him up again. Hey, buddy, time, time to get up here. Here's some more Pop-Tarts and a cup of coffee. And then he sends him on his way, and, and Elijah's going to hear from God. And he goes to the same place where Moses encounters the burden, burning bush. And so Elijah's thinking, man, there's going to be this big ball of fire, and that's where I'm going to be, see God. And nope, that didn't happen. And maybe there's going to be an earthquake. I mean, the earth is shattered, and, and there, that's where I'm going to say, no, that didn't happen. Maybe it's just going to be like a tornado, a mighty rushing wind, and God's going to show up. And no. Nope. But God comes to him in a still, small voice. You see, when, when we turn back to him in repentance, he gives us rest. And then in quietness and strength, we find our ability to trust in him. But when we don't, Man, the shame and the sorrow, they begin to take over in our lives. Do you recognize it? I mentioned this book last week. It's called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry by John Mark Comer. It's been so helpful to me. Maybe it'd be encouraging to you, but in, in that book, he, he gives a list of 10 things that are symptoms of hurry sickness. In other words, failing to rest. Ways that our life begins to look different. I wonder if these describe you. And maybe it's not what you think. Maybe you should ask, would the people around me, my family, those in my little corner of the world, would they describe me this way? Listen to these. Irritability. Hypersensitivity. Restlessness. Workaholism. Emotional numbness. Out of order priorities. Lack of care for your body. Escapist behaviors. You understand that one? Escapist behaviors are those things you're doing to try to just get out of reality for a moment. Whether it's that drink or that pill or something you're looking at or just numbing your mind on Netflix incessantly. Slippage of spiritual disciplines or isolation. Church, what, I, what I'm trying to do is wake you up to the danger of this failure to rest. And if these symptoms seem to express things that are going on in your life, you should hear the red light going off in your car or at the very least that yellow light that says empty and you're about to run out of gas. And in the midst of that, this is what the Sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says, in repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. But you would have none of it. I'm going through Isaiah in my personal time in God's Word as well. I think this morning I was in chapter 42 maybe, but these, these last couple of days have been some of my favorite chapters in Isaiah. And I've read passages like this one. Isaiah 40, verse 29, he gives strength to the weary. Aren't you, that would be a good place just to say amen if you believe that's true. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Thank you, Lord. Even youth grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. Praise the Lord. They'll soar on wings like eagles. They'll run and not grow weary. They'll walk and not be faint. Amen. But you would have none of it. And, and therein lies the question for today. Will, 
Will you return to Christ in, in repentance and rest and quietness and strength? Will you trust Him? Or are you just going to keep doing it your own way? So I, I just want to send you home with three questions to help you continue to process this. All right? If this is true. So this is what Isaiah was saying. In repentance. So repentance is, hey, I'm going this way. Everything seems fine. It's my way. All right. Oh, pothole. Whew, I barely survived that one. Oh, wreck. I made it through that one. But I'm going my way. Repentance is saying, this way isn't working. I, I'm going to turn, God, and I'm going to go your way. That's what the word means. So in repentance, I'm going to turn to you, and I'm going to rest. If you're willing to do that, how do you answer these three questions? Number one, what do you need to cease? What do you need to stop? Now, let's be real. Some of you have got some very destructive habits that you just need to stop. It's not even just about rest. You just need to stop it. It's, it's hurting you. It's hurting those around you. It's not okay. But some of you are not finding this time to rest in the Lord because you're you're never slowing down. He, he, that moment of quietness we had a while ago, man, it made you crazy because you never hear it that quiet. I mean, you go to sleep with the TV or, or the music on and you're not used to that quiet. What do you need to cease? What do you need to stop doing? Number two, what do you need to confess? Repentance implies that there's there's a change. Confession is agreeing with God about things that need to change. H has this alerted you to some things in your life that are unhealthy? That you just need to confess and agree with God? I'm going to get this right. Number three, what do you need to celebrate? What do you need to celebrate? See, rest is about us seeing God for what He's done, delighting in Him and knowing who He is. Celebrate Him today. I want you to bear with that distraction just another moment because this is the most important part. What will it be for you? Just a few days in our nation, we celebrate Juneteenth. Do you know what that is? It's a national holiday. It actually dates back to 1865. On June 19th, led by the Union soldiers, Gordon Granger came to Galveston, Texas, with news that the war had ended and those who were enslaved were now free. You know what's interesting about this date? It was two and a half years after President Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. For two and a half years, people had lived in slavery even though they had been declared free. It's interesting what happened even after this announcement. There was a great celebration. Many celebrated their new found freedom. And they went on to lives doing their jobs, making a difference in society. Some worked out relationships with those they had served and became sharecroppers, and history could record whether or not that was actual freedom. But some just chose to stay enslaved. It sounds unthinkable that this could happen until you look at us and you realize that we are gathered as the body of Christ. And that according to everything we understand in Scripture, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus has freed us from the slavery of sin. And that same Jesus has now told us, whatever else causes unrest in your life, come to me and I'll take care of it. And yet... We choose to go back to Egypt. Man. 
I don't know about you, but I'm going to choose repentance and rest. I'm going to choose salvation that comes through quietness and strength. I'm going to trust in the Lord. Let's pray together. Christ follower, man, so many of us held our hands up before the Lord a few minutes ago and just asked Him to fill us where we felt empty. We've acknowledged our neediness. And now we come to the what you're going to do about it moment. So can I make it practical for us today? We don't always do this, so please listen carefully. I know it's going to stretch some of your comfort zone. But, but some of us need to mark this moment. The Holy Spirit of God's doing a work in our lives, and, and we kind of need to nail down a stake. And so today I'm going to give you an opportunity in our response as we sing in a moment to, to come forward. And, and it may be for several reasons. Number one, you may just come forward and either stand or kneel and pray and just make this a private prayer moment. No one will come and disturb you. And just, But in this public place, you're just saying to God, I want to get this right. I want to rest in you. I'm, I'm tired of doing it on my own. I, I'm seeing the result as shame and sorrow. So I'm trusting you. I'm trusting you, Lord. I'm trusting you. If that's your desire. You could even begin to come right now and just kneel and pray and cry out to God. There will also be pastors from our church standing here. Maybe you just want to come and pray with somebody. If you're a lady, we would, we would love to find a lady to pray with you. If you're a gentleman, one of the pastors would be honored to pray with you or one of our men. But somebody's here and you've never begun a relationship with Jesus. Man, you've had some of the doing down. You, you're showing up, you're checking off the list, but, but you don't have a relationship with Jesus. Would you trust him today? Would you cry out to him in simplicity saying, God, I know I need you. I'm a sinner. I need to be saved. I believe you died for me, Jesus. You can handle it. I, I trust you. So for you, if, that, if that's you, when I say amen in just a moment, here's what I'm going to invite you to do. Come and take my hand or come and take Pastor Eliel or Pastor Nick's hand and, and just say that. I, I need to trust Jesus today. Let us lead you to faith in Christ. Father, as we begin to sing, as our pastors are standing here ready to receive the church body, Lord, as others are coming just to pray, our simple request is this. May we not waste this moment. Lord, may we come to your altar. May our hearts be open as your hands and arms are open. May we trust you. May we rest in you. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Would you stand together with me? God's leading some of you right now, even as some has come. You're coming to pray. You're coming to talk to one of our pastors. Whatever your need, right now, you step out. You come.